Right, I'm pretty sure everyone thinks I've quit YouTube forever, so now it's time to go outside into the glorious April springtime and relax. <laughs> ah, I forgot. I live in Britain. Fuck going outside anyway, that's what the PS1 is for. Whenever it's rainy, I play the PS1, and whenever it's sunny, I play the PS1. I need a life. But I can't enjoy playing PS1 anymore because every time I do, I think about the potential video I could be making about the game that I play. So, eh, I might as well make another video right now. All about... Bugs Life the Dragon! A Bugs Life on PS1. I tell you what, I have fond memories of this game. It was one of the first movie tie-in games I ever played when I was very small, so it was already a cool experience because I really enjoyed the movie as a kid, so being able to play it was like having your Christmas company bonus on your birthday on Halloween while you eat leftover Easter chocolate. Anyway, greetings and salutations, my beautiful people, and welcome back to the Kenneker Show, where I always have to do the duty of deciding whether or not things deserve to be slaughtered or salvaged, and yeah, I've been meaning to talk about this game for a really long time now, years in fact, but I just never felt inspired to. But now, I do. And with it being April in the middle of springtime, I can't think of a more appropriate game to play now because Bugs Life the movie has always reminded me of springtime. The deep, bright, luscious colours, the sunlight bouncing off of the plants, the Ants fucking everywhere, get off the picnic please! And I'm thrilled to report that after booting the game up and seeing actual FMV movie clips in relatively decent quality, the tutorial begins and it is pretty fucking spot on to the look and feel of the movie, so talk about a good first impression. The draw distance isn't perfect, but it's tolerable, it never made the game hard to play for me just because of how fast it plays, but it does get a little confusing in places like when I grab this telescope here. Well, look at that! Look at what? Oh, that! Not to mention the soundtrack. Oh my golly gosh gosh. Fuck! It's one of my favourites on the PS1, and I don't need to explain why. Just listen to it in the training level. <laughs> oh. Well, it might be a bit shy. Scratch the music for the time being, then. What have you got to say, Mr. Sign? Well, hello there, Flick. Hello! The ant's most basic line of defence is your berry throw. Okay, so his logic is a little bit questionable, but at least he's very thorough without being pandering, making the game easy to understand for kids and not patronising for adults. Jiminy Cricket, I haven't seen a token that colour in years. Uh, how could you not have seen one in years and then one just appears right there when you're talking about it? Oh, what's that? Oh, wait, I, I think I know what that is. I smell a little bit of bullshit! And after some more talking... You'll need to find another green token before you can reach the top. More talking... Standard bouncing mushroom. More talking... Well done. And more talking... Wrinkle. We can start off on level 1 out of 15 to help Flick find some warrior bugs to come back home and chase away the smelly grasshoppers bullying the ants into harvesting food for them. Plus they're sex offenders. A Bug's Life is a collectathon platformer with slightly open levels that all follow the events of the movie pretty well. You do have a goalpost to end the level in any way you'd like at any time you want, but in order to unlock all the bonus movie clips for your not yet available on VHS Pixar movie about sticky fucking insects, you need to do three tasks in each stage to completion. Find all flick tokens and gain a life, collect all 50 pieces of grain and fill your health back up, and lastly, mercilessly kill every last living creature with explosive golden berries. Because A Bug's Life is all about not allowing yourself to be bullied by bigger insects who are only makes sense to fucking murder all of the smaller ones. And if some of the levels appear too windy and confusing, like level 2 in the tunnels, the level that everyone says is the worst, but you fuckers clearly haven't played the canyons in a while, to help you find your way, you can activate... colourful... gas... Boils? If you don't want the bonus movie clips, then there's no real reason to go for 100%, but at the time this game came out, having a lot of the film available on your PS1 memory card was a great incentive. Plus, with the collectathon elements, I just can't help myself. It feels good to grab anything shiny or spinny. I think it's a condition. But I mean, even though you can get the film streamed in HD to a computer in your pocket nowadays, you may want to go for 100% anyway, because just running for the goalpost means the game will last you just under an hour, which is... Shit. And what else is shit? Well, this fucking camera, that's for sure. There's a camera locking button that pulls the image right back and lets it stay in the same place, which does have its uses, but freely turning it is a pipe dream. And the only way that you can get it behind your head again is to keep still and wait for it to catch up behind you, or keep tapping the look around button until it fixes it into place, which is alright, but whenever you're moving and need to keep on moving, well, oh. yeah, that happens a lot. At least the death noise is funny. Oh! <laughs> I love that. Instead of dying, it sounds like Flick just had his day ruined. <laughs> The real question is though, do I think that this game sucks like the entire internet seems to have decided over the last few years? Is this video going to be a hilarious meme fest of caddy rage while he fails to play a game about ants in a kids movie?
No. This isn't just nostalgia talking. How could I hate it? How could anyone hate it? The game is genuinely pretty good. I don't understand the hate. The options menu alone is adorable. How loud do you want your sound effect? Very buzzy? Or not very buzzy? Or quiet? And do you want vibration? Nah, Flick is alright, thanks. Or- Yes I do please and Flick is fucking loving it! Oh, I, I, could, I could travel to the city. I could search there. If you went, you'd be on that silly search for weeks. Hey, now, there's nothing silly about that. In fact, I do it pretty frequently. Yes, I found it! In all seriousness, no, the game is genuinely pretty good, and it may not be the highest standard of platformer, collectathon, or action game out there. I think Toy Story fucking 2 does it a lot better, but it's still a valiant effort from Traveller's Tales before they went and started World War 3. In order to progress through each stage to collect everything, you need to find the pre-mentioned seed token so you can grow different plants to reach different places. Each coloured token represents a different kind of plant to grow, like platform plants, launching plants, health and defence plants, etc. And the more of the same colour you collect, the more upgraded said plant becomes. Most of the time, these plant seeds you can grow also can be carried around anywhere, allowing you to take shortcuts and reach inaccessible areas if you're clever enough. And some plant types you cycle between can be used in conjunction with other plants in imaginative ways, like flying on a dandelion but then getting further distance with a fan, or even throwing seeds onto those fans to launch them up to higher levels. Some even give you new abilities like the incredibly fun super jump, the ridiculous cannon plant, and can even act as automatic attacks you can carry around with you, or even give you shield or invincibility periods, but the only way you can feel yourself getting stronger in these ways is by doing what the game is built around. Running, jumping, exploring and attacking your way around until you find all of these tokens via mini platforming puzzles and needing to use other upgraded plants to reach other tokens. There's a surprising level of freedom in that sense and there's no one certain way you can finish a level with all the different places you can put the seeds and all the different orders you can grab the tokens to upgrade them. And the devs even thought about how slow and vulnerable you are in the state of carrying seeds around so they allowed you to attack smaller creatures by throwing the seeds themselves. In level 1 for instance, I managed to complete it without grabbing around 5 or 6 plant tokens just because I played the game so many times and know how to break it apart like my asshole after a long old fart. I also love it whenever you go into free view mode and you get to see Flick's eyes as they follow exactly where you point the camera. Little details like that are equally cute and horrifying. To protect yourself in the game you need to throw... berries for as weird as that sounds. Don't know why you don't just bite everything to death like the little fuckers do in real life. Bastard ants. And there are different levels of power for them. Red is the default berry and so weak it can't even attack hard-shelled enemies. Blue is alright, double the power of red and actually hurts everything. Then there's the homing berries, mega homing berries, and then the elusive golden berry. <laughs> Unless you have an upgraded plant that allows you to grow <laughs> berries whenever you want to though, once you find the hidden <laughs> berry, do not grab any other fucking berry on your life. Otherwise you'll swap the <laughs> berry for whatever shitty little berry you just picked up with no way to get it back and you'll want to drown yourself in the tears you'll inevitably cry. <laughs> Berries though are awesome, they are hard to get but totally worth it. Not just for the chance to get the token related to it, but you can also eliminate the enemy from the stage forever until you exit. And in some levels you even get the chance to play with the harvester, which acts the same way as the <laughs> berry but sacrifices movement speed and jumping. You can also suck up any nearby grain, so that's nice. It's way cooler to just wait for the berry though, since they track wherever the enemies are pretty accurately, there's nothing more satisfying than grabbing it, running back through the stage, spamming the throw button and screaming Fuck you! At the top of your lungs while you exterminate everything in your path and the insects all bursting into pieces with that incredibly crunchy beefy sound effect makes it even sexier. Hey. It's so badass that even boss one, Thumper, can't handle it and just leaves the game. Before getting that <laughs> berry though, the next best thing in my opinion is using the bum bash and it feels alright when you splat and flatten the enemies, but the real treasure is clipping them just on the edge of their body so that when you hit the floor they explode. Oh, yeah. If you hold the jump button after a bum bash as well, you also get to do what I like to call the skid mark slide. <laughs> And what about the images for the stages? Am I the only one here that thinks that the image that they use for the council chamber level looks exactly like if Mrs. Potts from Beauty and the Beast had a moustache? Taylor's old as time. Oh, and the cliffside image just looks like someone making the derpiest face imaginable. <laughs> They must have done that on purpose. The level design as well is pretty good stuff. It's very similar to Toy Story fucking 2 in many ways, actually. It makes you feel like an ant in a larger than life series of trees and blades of grass towering over you. Leaves, coke cans, playing cards, matchboxes, pebbles, these are your obstacles. And tiny cracks in dry bits of ground are deep and dangerous canyons to overcome. The visuals in this department really help in bringing it to life and it really is just a shame the draw distance is as bad as it is. It could look a bit better, or at least do the Spyro thing of making the background much lower polygon counts to give the illusion of distance. And while contemplating this aspect of video game visual design from the late 90s, I noticed that Flick's name backwards is Kilf, and I don't know how to feel about that. Kite I'd like to fuck. 
And even though it's true to the style of the world, this doesn't help save the worst stage of the game. Stage 5, the Riverbed Canyon Maze. Yes, everyone who wants to meme it up and hate on this game only plays to level 2 and decides that that is too nonsensical and difficult, which it isn't that bad at all, guys, seriously. But this? This is the fucking worst. Where do I start? Uh. Well, one, it's a maze. Two, there's over 50 enemies constantly attacking and following you. Three, there's spiky acorn things dropping all over the place and spreading out spiky balls. Four, it features decent seed flying puzzles, but ones that are made needlessly difficult with the tight spaces and enemies everywhere. And if you want to 100% the stage, you need to grab the items on top of these puzzles. And speaking of those puzzles, five, the mounds of dirt you have to climb up before flying the seeds up are insanely slippy and the lack of camera control leaves you falling all of the damn time. Six, you get introduced to these disgusting fucking spiders with their beady little eyes, stupidly oversized legs, and spindly uncanny movers that make me feel itchy. <laughs> Seven, there's constant back and forth gameplay while you carry heavy seeds very slowly in order to grab more seed tokens to then go back to other areas once again in a maze. And finally, for a personal gripe, I was missing one fucking enemy for the goldberry token for fucking ages, and once I finally found it, I was rewarded with a bonus cutscene promptly glitched out and meant I had to reset the game and do the whole stage over again! But what else can you expect from a game that has a caterpillar in it that says very clearly It's okay, you can jump on my tummy! But then only allows you to jump on his back. This game is one of the states! Yes, the Riverbed Canyon does allow you to access the shield plant if you find all the tokens that helps out majorly with the sea transportation because I think the devs knew how much of a pain in the ass this level was, but no amount of shielding or- <laughs> can save this stage, it simply isn't that fun. I guess the second to last flying stage with Princess Atta isn't that fun either, but that's mainly because I made it 10 times more frustrating by trying to 100% it, so what do you expect in that situation? For most of the game though, aside from the camera, the controls behaved exactly like I expected them to, and it does feel good to zip and bounce around the stages. Even boss levels can be a little challenging. Yeah, mostly because of the camera. But they are all structured totally differently and have different methods of screwing you over. Thud of the Fly, for instance, throws berries at you while you avoid rubbish in this rolling can while he can remove your gold berry for the rest of the stage by throwing a super berry at you. And the bird you can't even reach until you lure it down with a homing berry plant that you have to grow. They're also made tons more stressful by the music. Yes, the music. Finally, took you long enough to get here, you... You... Video. It's ridiculously layered with tons of woodwind instruments weaving different melodies around each other, complementing the foresty themes of the visuals with weaving tree branches and overgrowing nature. And it's heavily percussive without any standard drum kit for a great sense of urgency and groove whenever it calls for it. It feels extremely primal and outdoorsy to add more light motif to the tracks. It's not typical platformer music, it actually manages to get away with using the same kinds of instruments for every single stage and it somehow matches the mood that each stage wants to give off beautifully. And it really didn't need to go as far as it did to make the game that much better, but it does anyway. It's the same thing I feel hearing the Toy Story fucking 2 soundtrack, even though that one is a lot more varied. Here's a taster for you! And you know what's even better? Guess who helped make this game? Yes, Dave Gibson. Sound effects are also pretty great too. When they aren't busy kicking your ass from their brilliance like the golden berry explosions or butt smashing, they act as great atmospheric ambience like with the raindrops in the last Ant Hill stage and just make the rest of the platforming gameplay feel better from the way that red berries bounce off of shells to the way things get splatted to the way that plants sprout to life when you jump on them. Flick also likes to chatter in the stages, and personally, though I think he can mouth off a little too much sometimes, it's never Gex levels of annoyance with pop culture reference spewing. Oh, come on, I'm too puny to eat. Oh, you have poo poo hands. Flick always has something sarcastic to say about the situation and reacts to what's happening to him and what enemies are around, and one or two lines did get a giggle out of me from how out of place they sounded. You are talking about the blood of the insects that you just crushed, potentially staining the ground that they once walked on. You're fucking sadistic!
There's also something wildly satisfying about grabbing a line of grain and hearing this cute plinky plonky repeating note scale sound off with each one that you grab. Grain, grain, grain. Picking up grain here. Hang on a second. Wait. So the mission of this stage is that I need to find all five of the blueberry scouts in order for them to fly the fake bird to scare the grasshoppers away. And, um, y you know the bird is right there, don't you? Why aren't you moving? Go! It's dead! Okay, fine, I'll go and get you myself. Come on, Dim, take her to the bird. She clearly can't be fucked to walk a few steps. No, no, Dim. Dim, wait, Dim, stop, where are you going? You're kidnapping her! And that concludes everything I think about Above's Life on PS1, but the main question is, what does the game get exactly? Well, despite what everyone else on the internet says, this game's fucking good, all right? And I'm always right, so it gets the salvage today. <laughs> Lovely. If it's your birthday today while watching this video, happy friggin' birthday to you. Please remember to stay beautiful, and don't worry guys, I was never going to leave YouTube. In fact, one of the main reasons I changed my mind about that is because I was made aware of all of the really kind things that other YouTubers and people had to say about me, like, um, uh, this guy, yeah, uh, Master J, yeah, 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 like that guy. I wonder what he has to say about the Kelikara show. An intro so forced, and obviously written last, that I was genuinely surprised to find out that it wasn't written by fucking Kadikarus, although it might as well have been, all it needed was a zoomed in high contrast Audio. Okay, let me explain one thing very clearly to you, you very nasty man. I don't think that could be any more untrue. In fact, I think I have some of the most philosophical and deep discussion on video games. Thank you so much for watching this video today everybody and special thanks to all the names on screen right now that have helped make this video possible via Patreon. And special thanks to all the top tier supporters, Omar Matu, Basil, Patrick Ferguson, Andy Ellis, Robert Alamsha, I Have a Portal Gun, Gamer Man, Chris Ingersoll, Exopaz, Kyle Way, Thomas Olsen, Mills Kahai, Alicia Knightley, Super Spyro Fan 2010, Daniel Leon, Jane Ives, Mitchell Reed, AD Thornton Smith, Oblivion Rising, Noxious, Ellen Wilpley, Kirsten B, QB, Nathan Young and Nicole Ganara. Thank you so much every single one of you.